if you take your Bibles tonight and open those Bibles to Psalm 106, we are in the same passage of Scripture we were this morning. I'm going to continue with that theme of abortion since today is National Respect for Life Day. And I want to talk to you about excuses that people make for abortion, in favor of abortion. Now, there's a lot of different excuses that people will use. And I want to tackle each one of them with the Word of God and old-fashioned common sense, and we'll see just how flimsy those excuses are. Never right to kill. Never right to kill an innocent person. The Bible tells us in verse 34 of Psalm 106, They did not destroy the nations concerning whom the Lord commanded them, but they were mingled among the heathen and learned their works, and they served their idols and were a snare unto them. Yea, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils and shed innocent blood, even the blood of their sons and their daughters whom they sacrificed unto idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. Notice in this passage of Scripture, let me just recap what I talked about this morning. They disobeyed God in verse 34. They were mingled among the heathen. They started to intertwine themselves. They learned the work of the heathen. They started to serve their idols or do the same thing the heathen did. And it was a snare or a trap unto them. And because of this, the Bible says they sacrifice their sons and their daughters unto devils. Never serve the gods of this world. The gods of this world will bring you down, 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 lower and lower and lower than you ever thought you would go. Don't follow the gods of society. Don't follow the gods of popularity. Don't follow the gods of prosperity. Those gods will let you down. Can I tell you, those gods are on unstable ground, shaky ground. For instance, the gods of society are always changing. They're never the same. Society changes from one position to another position. Uh, uh, for instance, today's society is a whole lot different than the society of 1950. It is. We have change, and society is always changing. Don't follow the God of society. Don't follow the God of popularity. People today are always trying to do something new to get noticed. They're always got a new Snapchat, or they always got a new Facebook post, or they're always trying to say something to gather attention. I'm saying this. I'm saying the gods of this world are unstable. They will leave you on shaky ground, the gods of society and the gods of popularity and the gods of prosperity. How much is enough? You tell me, how much is enough? One dollar, and then you got to have two dollars. And then you have two dollars, and you got to have three dollars, and so forth, and so forth. It is never enough. And so when you follow the gods of this world, they'll just keep on stringing you on, and stringing you on, and stringing you on, and pulling you down that old slimy, slippery slope going lower and lower and lower again. America today is in a crisis. America today is in chaos. America today is in collapse because we are killing our kids. And it's bad enough that we're doing that, but then we start to make excuses about it. Can I tell you, there are zero excuses for killing your children. Zero. You ought to love your kids because Christ loved your, ki loved your kids. And He cares about those children. And we said earlier this morning, Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Well, let's look at these excuses that people come up with about abortion, in favor of abortion. Here's the first excuse about abortion. It's not human. And perhaps you've heard this, it's a mass of tissue. Can I ask you something? What are you? Are you made out of steel? Are you made out of fiberglass? Hey, are you made out of aluminum? You say, well, preacher, it's just a mass of tissue. What do you think you are? Good night. That's all you are is flesh and blood. They're trying to say it's a mass of tissue. And you know the reason for that? It's because they're trying to dehumanize it. 
They're trying to say it's not a person. By the way, that's the same argument that Hitler had. That's why he killed over 60 million Jews. Why did he kill so many? Because he dehumanized them. That's the same argument Stalin had. That's the same argument they used with slavery. Well, it's not a human being. Can I tell you, it is a human being. It is a human being. And you can make all kinds of excuses and try to say, no, it's not human. It's just a mass of tissue. But the Bible tells us in the Word of God that it's a child, it's a baby. By the way, if it's just a mass of tissue, and that's all it is. Why is there such great opposition to it? Why do people get out? And why do people form a human chain from one end of town clear to the other end of town if it's just a mass of tissue? You don't see people out there protesting for hysterectomies, do you? You don't see people out there uh, protesting because of tonsillectomies. No, you don't see people protesting for that. But you do see people protesting for for the unborn child in the womb. I saw an article, I read it, some time ago, of a doctor who was performing surgery on a baby. And this was a famous doctor. He was world-renowned because he could actually perform surgery while that baby was still in the womb. And he cut that womb open, and he was going through where the stomach is. And he was going to perform surgery on that 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 mass of tissue, as the feminists would like to say, as Planned Parenthood would like to say. And guess what that mass of tissue did? That mass of tissue reached out of the womb and grabbed a hold of that doctor's fingers. Now, brothers and sisters in the Lord, I've got Holy Spirit goosebumps about right now. I want you to understand something that is a life in the womb. And you can close your eyes to the truth, but that does not change the truth. When Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit of God, was it just a mass of tissue? Is that all it was? Was it something that wasn't human? Luke chapter 1 verses 42 through 44 gives us the account. And the Bible says, And she spake with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women. And blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord? Now I want you to understand here is Elizabeth talking to Mary. Elizabeth, mother of John the Baptist. And here is Mary, the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ. She's conceived of the Holy Ghost. And here's what Elizabeth said. She says, from whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord? You know what that is? A person. Then it says, should come to me, for lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in my ears, this is what happened, the babe leaped. You know what that is? A purposeful action. It says the babe leaped in the womb for, get this, for joy. Now I want you to understand something. That babe that was in the womb leaped for joy. Do you know what John the Baptist did? He did flips in the womb. You say, why did he do that? Because he met the Lord Jesus Christ when Jesus was still in the valley. Good night. Is Jesus just a massive tissue? Is that all he is? What was conceived by the Holy Ghost was not just a massive tissue. It was the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm saying people come up with all kinds of excuses today to promote abortion and say, well, it's just a mass of tissue. Don't fall into that trap. That's the same trap that Hitler put out. That's the same trap that Stalin put out. And so many others who have killed many, 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 many people. Excuse number two. The fetus could not survive outside its mother's womb on its own. That's the excuse they use. Well, you see, that baby could not survive by itself outside of the mother, and so it's just going to die. Well, let me tell you something. A baby that is even born, let alone in the womb, a baby that is born can't take care of itself. A paralyzed person can't take care of itself. A, a person who has a pacemaker, guess what? He needs somebody to help him too. Somebody that has insulin. They need somebody to help them too. That ID 
ideology of survival of the fittest is a secular philosophy. Let me show you what the Bible says about it. Romans chapter 14 verse 7. The Bible says, for none of us, zero, nobody, for none of us liveth to himself and no man dieth to himself. You know what that Bible verse is telling us? No one can survive without another person. We need someone else. Paralyzed person can't take care of himself. Baby can't take care of itself. In fact, I wonder how many wives here would say that their, with a, their husband without them would be lost. Does that make your husband obsolete? No, it just makes him a big baby. But he's your baby to take care of. Listen, we need each other. To say that the fetus could not survive outside of its mother's womb on its own is a lie propagated by the devil. We all need somebody. They have people going around today needing insulin. People going around needing surgery. Well, they can't survive without surgery, so we're going to let them die. I'll tell you something. This abortion issue is heading down a slippery slope to euthanasia. It's headed down a slippery slope to see the government's going to tell you who can live and who can die. People can't survive without Facebook. People can't survive without a refrigerator. There's some folks that can't survive without a refrigerator. Does that make them any less human? No. Truth of the matter is, nowadays, they can have a baby that survives and living on its own outside of the mother's womb, and now they're putting that baby to death. They're killing that baby. They're letting that baby starve on the operating table and die on its own on the operating table. Excuse number three. It's to save the mother's life. Now here's one that you hear quite often. It's to save the mother's life. In modern medicine, I wonder, is abortion the only answer we have? Now when you think about that, you're thinking, well, yeah, okay, well you got two different lives here. And you got the mother's life and you got the baby's life. And if the baby's going to hinder the mother's life, then maybe abortion would be okay. And, and in that case, to save the life of the mother. I got a radical concept, okay? Can I give you this new concept? It's a new modern idea. How about saving both of them? I mean, what's the matter with that? Good night. We got to pick one or the other. I want to pick both. Man, I'm so glad whenever Jesus went to the cross of Calvary, he not only picked Brother Louie, but he picked me. I'm glad he didn't say, well, it's either Brother Louie or Pastor Swank or it's got to be one or the other. No, he picked us all. And in modern science, to say that the only option we have is for one or the other, boy, that sure tells you something about today's medicine, doesn't it? It tells me they're, st yeah, they're practicing medicine all right. And you're the guinea pig they're practicing on until they get it right. Here's what a doctor says, Dr. Joseph P. Donnelly. He was a former medical director of Margaret Hogg's Hospital in New Jersey from 1947 to 1961. He says in, it, there was in their birthing uh, delivery, 115,000 deliveries in the maternity ward. 115,000, this is what he says. There was not a single abortion. 115,000. Without a single abortion, Dr. Donnelly said, abortion is never necessary to save the life of the mother. I didn't say it. He said it. Never necessary. You say, well, preacher, who is he? He is a doctor that has seen 115,000 births. I heard a story of a soldier. Someone threw a grenade in. His platoon was there. You know what the soldier did? He jumped on the grenade. You know what it cost him? His life. But he saved his platoon. Well, why did he jump on that grenade? Didn't he realize that was going to cost him his life? Yeah, but it's called a sacrifice. Good night, what kind of person would say, I deserve to live above you? What kind of person would say, my baby doesn't deserve to live I want to live. It's called a sacrifice. And in today's society, all we care about is ourselves. 
We have become so selfish and self-centered. Israel went down that slippery slope where they disobeyed God. They were mingled. They learned. They served. And they were snared. And they started to kill their children. You know what Israel became? A has-been. If you're not careful, if you're not careful, you know what you're about to become? A has-been. Well, I used to be a children's worker, but not anymore. I has been a children worker, not no more. I has been a church member, but not no more. Do you know how many has-beens we have in churches today? Where they used to do, but not anymore. I, I has been a soul winner, but, but not anymore. Bless God, I'm going to tell you something. I want to go out in a, in a, in a, flare, in a, in a fire. I mean, I want to do something for the glory of God. I don't want to rust out. Man, I'd rather burn out than rust out any old day. They say it's to save the mother's life. That's excuse number three. Oh, we've got all, we've got all kinds of excuses. By the way, they're coming up with new ones each and every day. Do you know that? I like what Thomas Edison said. He said, if you've got a good excuse, don't use it. And too many of us, we've got all kinds of excuses. And it's a, we're looking for another excuse. So give me another excuse. Here's another excuse. This is my body. I'll do what I want with it. Oh, it is. Your body. Oh, so you're the God of your own universe. Is that the way it is? I, this is my body and I'll do what I want. Well, you can say it's your body, and you can say you'll do what you want, but that ain't true. Just cause you say it, don't make it so. Someone said, well, this is my body, I'll do what I want. Well, can you abuse drugs? Uh, come with me to the jail ministry, and I'll show you some folks that thought that they could do whatever they want with their body. And you know where they are today? In jail. You can't prostitute yourself. You can't yell fire in a crowded theater. Why? Because there's laws against it. So for someone to say, well, this is my body, I'll do what I want with it. By the way, it's not your body. Do you realize you were created by God Almighty? God made you. Well, this is my body. Well, how'd you get that body then? Huh? God made that body. Bible said, the Bible says this in Revelation 4.11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power, for Thou hast created all things. And for thy pleasure they are and were created. By the way, you goof off at work, guess who you answer to? The boss. You goof off at school, kids, guess who you're going to answer to? The teacher. You goof off in your car, you're going to answer to the police. And you want to goof off in life, can I tell you who you're going to answer to? You're going to stand before God Almighty one day. You say, well, preacher, he that dies with the most toys wins. He that dies with the most toys still dies and meets God. And the Bible tells us this in 2 Corinthians 5.10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that which he hath done, whether it be good or bad. You live how you want, but you just remember you're going to answer to God someday. By the way, you can do all sorts of things that are ungodly. The government has ordained a lot of different things that says now it's okay to do that. Why, if you want to marry a man, man, you can marry a man, man. A woman, if you want to marry a woman, woman, you can marry a woman, woman. They, they've legalized liquor and they're legalizing drugs. They're starting to, trying to, and it's going to get worse and worse and worse. You say, well, preacher, the, the government says it's okay, so it's okay. Well, the government might call it okay, but God don't call it okay. Who do you worship? Do you worship Uncle Sam, or do you worship a God in heaven who sits on the throne? So it is your body, and you want to do with what you, but you're going to answer to God someday for it. You're going to answer to Him. Excuse number five. Excuse number five is this. It's what's best for the mother's health. I am telling you, these old strangly-haired, green-eyed, 
big mouth, long tongue feminists today that want to get out there and say, well, it's what's best for the mother. They could care less what's best for the mother. All they care about is what's in their political party and what's on their political agenda. It's what's best for the mother. I wonder how many mothers are heartbroken after the abortion. I wonder how many mothers are depressed after the abortion, suicidal after the abortion. They don't care about mothers. He said it's what's best for the mother's health. In other words, if the mother would be unhappy or unsatisfied or restricted. In other words, the world revolves around them. You know, I, I wish people would think about this before they start whoring around. You say, preacher, that's a little blunt. You know what we need? We need some old-fashioned, plain preaching today. Amen. Good night. Some people need to keep their legs crossed. Amen. Their pants up. It's what's best for the mother's health. So in other words, if it's going to infringe upon your youth or your friends and your time alone with them or your college or your career or your fun, oh, I forgot you are the princess. You're the queen. And the whole world revolves around you. Just as long as, hey, it doesn't care about anybody else. Just as long as you're not the one that's inconvenienced. I'll tell you, you might run and you might have an abortion, but you'll never forget it. You'll never forget it. You'll be reminded about it in all eternity. The Bible talks about memory. Memory is something you can't get away from. There's people today that are haunted by the memory. By the way, if you've had an abortion, there is forgiveness. Praise God, it was nailed to Calvary's cross. There is forgiveness through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we're not going to ignore it and say, no, it's not what it is. We're not going to say, well, it's, no, no, it's not sin. It's something else. No, it's downright dirty sin. It's murder. That's what it is. But I want you to know something. God can forgive that. Proverbs 10, 7 says the memory, here it is, the memory. The memory of the just is blessed. The person that does right is blessed. But the name of the wicked shall rot. You talk about the memory of the wicked shall rot. Did you get that? Rotten memories. Rotten memories. You might run, but you'll never forget. That baby... I wonder if it was a, would be a boy or a girl. You'll run, but you will never forget. I wonder what color hair that baby would have. I wonder what color eyes that baby would have. I wonder what kind of personality that baby would have. Can I tell you, there are people today that the memory of those things haunt them. They have rotten memories. And understand it well. The trash might stink but you are the one that made the trash. The old timers will say, you made your bed, now you got to sleep in it. And brother, you can run from a lot of things, but one thing you can't run from, and that is you. You can't run from you. Wherever you go, there you is. You can't run from you. And your memory comes, and your memory is there. And man, oh man, oh man, oh man, oh man, the memory of the wicked, the Bible says, the memory of the wicked shall rot. Excuse number six. The world is overpopulated. Preacher, do you realize the world is overpopulated? Well, not here it ain't. We got all kinds of room at Liberty Independent Baptist Church. Man, if it's populated where you are, move. And go to some place where it's not populated. You know what? God said in Genesis 1.28, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply. God's commandment for Adam and Eve was to multiply. God didn't have a revision, God didn't have a relapse, and God didn't have a recall. He said, Be fruitful and multiply. Well, God didn't know anything. He didn't realize we were going to make it to 2019. He didn't realize that we were going to get crowded. It was... God's a little absent-minded, isn't he? The, the, the forget about those types of things and not understand that we're going to get crowded. Good night. Are we stupid or what? God said be fruitful and multiply. They tell me that all the people in the world, every one of them, could fit side by side in the greater Jacksonville area. Jacksonville, Florida. Now I want you to understand something. The world's a big place. 
if it's crowded where you are, move. By the way, just because it's crowded, that doesn't give an excuse to kill someone. Man, you get on a crowded elevator, you might feel like you want to kill someone, but you can't kill someone on a crowded elevator. You get on a crowded store, how about Black Friday sale? It's crowded in here. Well, let's eliminate some people and kind of loosen it up a little bit. Give us a little bit more leg room. I'm going to tell you something. It's not an excuse for murder. And to say, well, the world's overpopulated. Again, if it's crowded where you are, move. You know where the, the least crowded place is? Right up front. Amen. Move from the back to the front. Amen? By the way, you can see the preacher a whole lot better. The world is overpopulated. Mm. Uh, excuse number seven. Let's move on here. The excuse number seven. The child may be handicapped or imperfect. So what they are saying there is this child is handicapped or imperfect and does this imperfection, does this def uh, defect give logic to kill? Well, again, if this is, then Hit Hitler's logic to kill, millions of unfit and useless makes perfect logic. But just because a person is handicapped or imperfect does not give us an excuse to kill someone. By the way, who, who set the definition or the standard of perfection here? I mean, who, who's, who's the person that's going to say, okay, this person is the, is the standard of perfection? I mean, tell you, if you are the standard, if you're trying to set yourself up and say, I am the standard of perfection, then the rest of us got a pretty good shot at this thing. Because you ain't all that. I know that. But somehow or another, all their def they got a defect. Uh, they're not to, what they ought to be. God cares about what you call imperfect. He does. There was a six-year-old that came home with a note from the teacher a long time ago. That six-year-old was handed a note from the teacher, and that six-year-old carried that note home and gave that note to his mother. The note said this, Please take this boy out of school. He's too stupid to learn. That boy's name was Thomas Edison. Let me tell you something. What you call stupid... What you call imperfect, what you call a defect, I want to tell you something. God cares about what you ignore. God cares about what you call imperfect. Exodus 4.11 says this. God's talking to Moses. And God says to Moses, And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? Or who maketh the dumb, or the deaf, or the seen, or the blind? Have not I the Lord... I want you to understand something. God cares about those that we would deem imperfect. Just because somebody has Down syndrome does not give an excuse for murder. Well, that baby in the womb has Down syndrome, so we're going to put that baby out of that baby's misery. Or that baby has a, a heart problem. I've seen babies, and I've seen some babies that are born that did not live very long. But I'll tell you what, that mother made that decision. I'm not going to kill that baby. I'm going to give that baby a chance. We're not perfect. God cares about what's imperfect. God cares about you. You know, when God looked down from heaven before he sent Jesus Christ, he looked down to heaven. The Bible says that he looked upon mankind and he... Realize you know what mankind is? A sinner. Imperfect. We are all imperfect. Every one of us. It's a good thing God didn't say, well, I think I'm just going to kill them. I'm just going to do away with them. I'm going to execute them because they're not perfect. You're not perfect, and 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 you're not perfect. So God said, I'm going to kill him. No. You know what he did? He extended his love. Sent Jesus Christ. And Jesus gives us a chance. You know what I wish, I wish, I wish our society would do? I wish at least our country would do. Give babies 
a chance. Give them a chance. Don't snuff out their life so early they can't even they can't even fight for themselves or defend themselves. Snuffing out their life, not even giving them a chance. God cares about those children. Excuse number eight. Excuse number eight is the child would create a financial burden for the home. That child, preacher, would create a financial burden. My question is, what child does not create a financial burden? Every child creates a financial burden. The more children you have, the more expenses you have. But can I tell you, the greater blessing you have. I know all about children and expenses. I've got at my house a daughter who has just turned 15. Now for you mathematicians, I want you to understand something. She is smack dab right in the middle of her teenage years. I've got myself a full-blown teenager on my hands. You talk about expense. Oh, I know it. Anybody that's raised children know all about the expense of kids. They do create a financial blessing, a burden upon you. But what a blessing they give to you. By the way, before you start cutting kids down and cutting the lives of kids off, how about cutting your expenses? Oh, they would they would create a financial ble- a burden upon me. How about cutting your cell phone? How about cutting your cable? Hey, how about cutting your satellite? How about cutting yourself down to one car? Hey, how about cutting down on your eating out? Instead of cutting off children, killing children. Children would create a financial burden. Good night. Every child, every one of them creates a financial burden. But children, the Bible says, are a priceless future. Priceless. Priceless. Psalm 127 verse 3 says, Lo, children are a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is His reward. You know what he's saying? Those children are a priceless future. They are. I didn't say it was easy to raise them. Anybody that tells you it's easy to raise kids, you know how many people have raised a child or two. You know how difficult it is. So when someone tells you, oh, raising children is just a walk in the park, you say, yes, it is just a walk in the park, but it's Jurassic Park. (laughs) I know it's hard. I know it's not easy, but it's still right. It's still right. Don't do wrong, do right. Our country today is in crisis and chaos and collapse because we are killing our kids and we are making excuses for it. America, stop killing your kids. I'll close with this story. An old jewelry factory that was closed down. They were cleaning it out. They decided to sweep everything out and they swept it all up and put it in piles and threw it in a trash can. And somebody thought to themselves, I wonder, I wonder about that trash that they're throwing out. They took that trash and they took it to a refinery. They found out that in that trash, when they put it through the refinery, there was $3,000 in gold dust in that dirt they were throwing out. What they thought was trash was treasure. Can I tell you what we're doing today? We think it's trash. It's not. It's treasure. Don't throw away the valuables. Don't throw away your future. Don't throw away your heritage. Don't throw away your kids. They're not garbage. They're not trash. And they're not junk. And what's bad 
is that we're having abortions all across this world. All around this globe. And we're throwing away that which is priceless. We need to stop abortions. We do. Stop them. Jesus loves the little children. All the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. It's bad enough to kill kids. Don't make excuses for it. Don't make excuses for it. Don't make excuses for it. There is no excuse for killing an innocent child. It's murder. Let's stand for prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father, we don't know what we're doing in our country. Lord, we've lost our minds. Worse than that, Lord, we've lost our conscience, our morality, our decency, our respect for life. Lord, we're shooting ourselves down. We're shooting ourselves in the foot. Lord, we're throwing away that which is a treasure, counting it as trash. Oh, dear God, I pray, Lord Jesus, there might be a turning in this country, a turning to God and a turning to the Bible. Dear God, help us, Lord. Lord, and we at times, Lord, we see our efforts in God. We think our efforts might be feeble, but God, help us to realize, God, these efforts are important. And Lord, we need to do something. I'd rather do something small than nothing at all. God, help us. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I want to ask you this question, and I'm asking this to Christians. I wonder how many Christians will say, Preacher, I am willing to make a concentrated effort in my prayer life to pray that God would end these abortions in our country. I wonder how many are like that. I see hands everywhere. I see hands everywhere. You put those hands down. Let's pray about that. God can do some great things. And God can move us to do great things for Him. I wonder if there's anyone here tonight to say, Preacher, I'm not saved. I'm not sure I'm going to heaven when I die. I want to go but I'm just not 100% sure that I'm going. Preacher, preacher, I need to be saved. I wonder if there's anybody like that with an upraised hand. Know that our size is small tonight. Small, there might be one here that's not sure. Oh, don't go through life 98% sure or 99% sure or even 99.9% sure be a hundred percent know that you know that you know that you know that you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior Heavenly Father be with this invitation time God maybe perhaps people want to come and pray for our country Lord perhaps they want to pray about something God you spoke to their heart about but Lord as we open the altar God and as we sing the invitational hymn God deal with us we pray in Jesus name Amen